relaxed with, uh, with grace, so don't worry about too much about that. I don't expect you to solve 100% of whatever I propose you solve. It's 95% uh, is totally fine. <laughs> no, I mean, it depends on... Uh, so, some of these things are meant to be... What I want... Uh, when I propose some of the exercises to you, I want to give chance. If someone wants to go the extra mile, so I know, okay, this guy or this girl went hard to solve this exercise, and I won't forget that little bit. So, just to give chance, uh, lots of chances for you too. Well, but uh, it's a really nice process. Yes, did you yeah, like I really, it? I really enjoyed it. Um, I think most of us enjoyed it. Like Okay, good. We've been working on it for a week or something. Was it easy? No, uh, no, 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 no. It was not easy, that's okay. Yeah, I that's didn't mean it to be easy. Was it hard? Very hard. hard. Like, like hard impossible or hard no, possible? Not hard. Not impossible. Because the level of problems that, I, that I'm aiming for is like medium to hard. I don't want any easy problems. Well, maybe just one or two just to warm up. But I don't want any problem to be just a a given thing, okay, okay, this is quickly, I do over lunch, like, I imagine writing the solution, no, I want every problem to have a little bit of some inspiration and that, 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 that it teaches you something, right? On the other hand, I don't want it to be possible that you cannot go and solve, so it's medium to hard, I think it's the level of problems that make you grow as a, as a, as a scientist, so. so I hope you enjoyed, let's keep on this written, or should we make it Epsilon less hard. Is that okay? Or should we keep at the same level? Same level. Good. That's what I want to hear. Or even hard, even right? Hard. Okay. Even hard. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good guys. <laughs> so when I taught this course, I guess for the first time at Inkwa, there was one student who was always complaining that the homeworks and the exams were too easy. And then, as you can imagine, everybody else in the classroom was pissed with this guy. I said, but how do you say that? I mean, what? You're doing us no favor, man. This is... The guy was finally the top of the class, but he was very good. Uh, all right, so today we are in lecture number five, right? So we will talk a little bit about Hambana. Here, let's say part one. And uh, so my idea now is to go over the next classes a little bit uh, following the presentation of Brzee's book. Okay, so now is the point that we had our introduction to real analysis. I hope I reminded you of or, or even taught you for the first time some of the facts of real analysis that I find useful that we'll be dealing with in the scores, the LP spaces, this convolution, this differentiation, this maximum functions, these are topics that I find really fun. And I thought it was worth spending four lectures to warm up a little bit this course. But this is, now, today we start what is conventionally known as functional analysis, okay? And I want to follow the book of Brazil for at least a little bit, and then we might come back to some, to some ad hoc uh, stuff. So let's see. So, yeah, from now on we can follow chapter one of, of, of the book of Brazis. Does everyone have access to the book? Does everyone have Does the book? Have the book or borrow the book or something? Okay. So I, I might, in say, future homeworks, just to save space, say, why don't you guys solve problem alpha, beta, and gamma off the chapter one of the book? So I will be referring to the latest version of the book, okay? So, so that we are in agreement. All right. So what we want to do today is to discuss one of the fundamental... So for the next couple of classes, this week and next week, we'll be discussing this basic, this classical theorems in functional analysis, the Hambana theorem, the closed graph theorem, the open mapping theory, okay? And uh, maybe some of you have seen this before, that's okay, you just have a chance to review, maybe catch a glimpse on some new ideas, 
Uh, the proofs are standard, so in most of the books that you will read, uh, you'll find essentially the same proofs. So there will be no surprises. I hope to have some new ingredients or new motivation for you guys in the homework problems that you can take on how to apply these theories. That's why that's where the real value lies in understanding the theorem, but also adapting them to real life situations. So, okay, this is how I use this theory. Okay, I'm gonna just start. Uh, Let's have a discussion following a little bit the presentation of the book of Brisbane. So, in this first part, E, we denote this is going to be just a vector space over R. Okay, so from our perspective, we'll always be dealing with vector spaces over R. If you want to work with vector spaces over the field C or other fields, there may be minor modifications. Uh, but that's sufficient for our purposes. So the thing that I want to prove to you, let me just write the statement here properly, theorem, one, the class today, this is the Hahnemann theorem. Hans Hahn and Stephen Bannock, two mathematicians, proved this theorem around 1920s, 19, late 20s. So the thing is the following. Let P from E to R be a function satisfying uh, two conditions. Condition number one is that P is P of lambda x is lambda P of x for any x in your vector space E and any lambda bigger than E. And the second condition is that P is what we call sublinear. P of x plus y is less than the equal of P of x plus P of y. For any x and y below E. Good. Now, let G be contained in E be a subspace, what we call a linear subspace. Okay, and let little g in this space g to r be a linear function such that. G of x loses to this function p of x for any x where this function little g is defined. So just any x in this subspace g. The conclusion of the theorem is therefore then there exists a linear functional f from e. About uh, it's a lecture about how to give presentations. Was anyone in this lecture before here? I really suggest you take a look at the at the YouTube channel of ICTP to see if this lecture is being recorded and it's going to be posted. It's really worth it. How to give a nice presentation generally, either in science or in business. There was, this was the topic. It has nothing to do particularly with optics, but 
The lecture was from 2.30 to 4.30, and I had to leave early to come here to the class. So I, I missed the end, but the guy was a very fun lecturer. OK. <clears throat> so this theorem is a theorem on how to extend linear functions. So we start with a vector space. So this is E for us. It's just a vector space. So you can uh, add two vectors, you, and you can multiply by a scalar in the scalar field. So this is a vector space over R, or through this, this our scalar field is R. Okay. Most of what I'm going to say here can be extended to C. Sometimes it's a slightly different version of the harmonic theorem over C, but this is the harmonic over R. Uh, and uh, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the notions of vector space, what is a subspace of this this guy, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not saying it's a, there is no norm in principle, there is no scalar product, no norm. It's not a Banach space, it's just a pure plain vector space. But it might be infinitely dimensional. So this is where the, the main difference between functional analysis and linear algebra will start to kick in. Some people say that linear algebra is that some people say that functional analysis is just linear algebra in infinite dimensions. You're not completely wrong. Is this one? It's a good first approximation. It's, it is linear algebra in infinite dimensions. So you see that uh, uh, some of the same phenomena will keep happening, and some uh, some phenomena won't happen as in the finite dimensional case. And we need new interpretations or new investigation on, on these phenomena, right? So here the setting is I essentially I will have a linear functional G on a subspace, and I would like to extend to a linear functional in the in the whole space. A, a functional for us will just be a map from your space or subspace to the field of scalars to R. Okay? That is linear. Okay, so a functional for me. Observation. Right. So whenever I talk about the functional, so g from g to r. When I say these words, and I'm just going to say once, and we will keep this forever. A linear functional. When you hear the word functional, is just a map from your space or subspace to r. And when you hear the word linear, it just means that uh, you know g of lambda x is equal to lambda g of x. This for all lambda in the field of scalars, and a g of x plus y is equal to g of x plus g of y. So it's linear with respect to addition and linear with respect to multiplication in the field of scalars. Okay? Now, so the general question that this theorem is trying to answer is when do you have, say, a linear functional in your space, in your subspace here, G, and you can extend this linear function to a function, to a linear function F in the whole space. When can you do that? So to extend a function to a new function in the whole space, this means what? This means that a function that coincides with G, that is a linear function in the whole space, so it's linear in the whole space, it maps into R, that extends G that is equal to G, in the common subspace with big G. Right? And the next conclusion of the theorem is that this function f will keep losing to this, let's say, uh, upper bound function. So you see, the, con the, the, the right setting for this to happen is that, OK, so let's assume that I have a function p. This is going to be my upper bound function from e to r. This is not a linear function. It's just a function that maps to r. I'm not even saying it maps to the positive numbers in principle. Such that when I multiply by a scalar, a positive scalar, this scalar com comes up. So p of lambda x is lambda p of x for any x in the space and any lambda positive. And p of the sum loses to the sum of the piece. So it's sublinear. This is, this is going to be. Suppose you have this function p, and suppose you have a linear functional defined on a subspace G that loses to this function p on that subspace. Then the conclusion is that, yes, you can extend the linear function g to a linear function f in the whole space. And second, this extension will keep losing to this upper bound p in the whole space. OK? This is the harmonic theory. Uh, all right. Can g uh, itself be the, can we use g as a upper bound for itself? 
you need to have on the upper bound that is defined in the whole space. Ah. This little g is just defined on this subspace. So you need to have this a priori form. Most of the times, most of the times, okay, observation one, observation two, so most of the times, you should look at this little little p of x as being something like uh, some some something like the modulus of x. If you are in a in a norm vector space, if you have a norm, so a norm would be something that trivially satisfies this, right? So it's uh, if you multiply by scalar, the scalar comes out, and it's sublinear because of the triangle inequality. So most of the applications you would be looking for such a function g when you have uh, uh, for the norm of the function. But here, remember that we are not in a norm vector space, so norm doesn't even exist. Here. So this is, let's say, the replacement for a more, more generic replacement. Uh, the proof of this theorem you might have seen before in your life, let's just try to remember. It uses this so-called very nice Zorn's lemma. Now, I will state here what Zorn's Zorn lemma is, and the most important thing about Zorn's lemma is to actually understand its statement and understand how to use it. Now, I will leave it to you if you want to actually prove it, uh, starting from the well-ordering principle or any other of the axiom of choice or something. I mean, this is up to you. You go there and, and you will, you will uh, take a look at that. I won't uh, dive into matters of logic here. Uh, but it's nice to see at least once in your life the proof of all of these things and why they are equivalent to each other. Axiom of choice, Sorn's lemma, well ordering principle, and so on and so forth. Right? There are people that believe that the Earth is not uh, round, that the Earth is plane. Right? So there are people in mathematics that don't believe this thing, Sorn's lemma, or the axiom of choice, or the well ordering principle. We won't argue with these people. Uh, yes, I'm serious. And this is less crazy than people believing that the Earth is plane. If someone here believes that they're Spanish, there's no offense here, okay? It's just... Uh, <laughs> there, is. there is. That's okay, okay? This is just... Uh, uh, I'm just saying that this... Once I was given a lecture, and uh, I invoked Zorn's Lemma in one of the proofs that I want. One very nice person from the audience that I'm not going to say he disbelieved Zorn's Lemma, he just didn't like it. And this guy is a Phillips, Phillips medalist. And uh, he came to me after the lecture. By the way, in this step that you proved, you did your proof using Sorn's lemma. I am sure this should be possible without invoking Sorn's lemma. We have to do the direct proof and so on and so forth. And I said, well, yeah, maybe and so on. And I, after two years of thinking on related problems, I could actually figure out the proof without using Sorn's lemma. And I came back to him and said, yes. And by the way, you are right. I mean, there was a proof without using Sorn's lemma, just with some clever approximations and so on. So, yeah, this is just. Uh, 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 a nice discussion here. But uh, so, what is Zorn's lemma? Simply put, let me just write it definition, and uh, we will discuss each of these uh, things. So every uh, non-empty ordered set uh, that is inductive. has a maximal element. This is Zorn's lemma. This is one way to write it. Every, say, non-empty ordered set, or if you want to actually, you can actually put here partially ordered set, if you want. Every non-empty partially ordered set that is inductive has a maximal element. Simply put, if you wanted to tell a friend on the bus in 10 seconds, that's the sentence you would say. Okay? Now we have to actually understand what it means. So we have to focus on the words in this sentence that we do not understand yet. What is a well, non empty is very clear to everyone what's non empty is. <laughs> What is a partial order? What's a partially ordered set? What is inductive? And what is a maximal element? So let's uh, figure out a little bit about these three objects. 
All right, I will erase here and I will rely on your annotations when we get back to the proof of the theory. Let's see. So we will talk about what is a partially ordered set. So, so let's say x. x is one set, and the partial order will, will, will suggest a symbol for it. Okay? So let's just use the symbol less than or equal as our partial order. I mean, if, if this is just suggestive that some of the properties of the usual order of the real numbers hold, but if you don't like the symbol, you could just use an asterisk or a point or your favorite fruit, heart, whatever you want. Okay? As the symbol of two elements being having a relation between each other, right? So this means that some pairs, some pairs are ordered. Some pairs of elements, let's say some pairs of elements, A, B, belonging to X, plus X are ordered. Not all pairs, right? Some pairs are ordered. And this order has to verify this following properties. Let's say just that each element is less than or equal than itself. Let's see. And the order has to be transitive. So if A is less than or equal than B, and B is less than or equal than C, then a and C are ordered, and A is less than or equal than C. Okay? So, I want to emphasize that the, 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 the nice thing here is that not all pairs of elements are comparable. Just some pairs of elements are comparable. But every time that you compare things, you have to play the game according to these rules. Okay? Every element is comparable to itself. Let's just use it as an axiom. As if A is comparable, if A is less than or equal than B, and B is less than or equal than C, then A is comparable to C and is less than or equal than C. Okay, so let's say one example of this one on basic. What about, hmm? what about B and B symmetry? Well, I'm not even going to assume that if A is less than B and B is less than or equal than A, then B is equal to A. Uh, I'm, I'm, Question if this can be proved using these things or, or not, but uh, but let's just leave it out. We are not even going to assume that. We won't need that situation. Okay. Uh, ex a basic example of this is that if you take say a a subset, say a in uh, one, two, three, four, and you take your x as being the, 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 the set of subsets of A, you know, so this, sometimes we call P of A. So this is the set of subsets of A. So if A has four elements, this P of A has 16 elements. And we would order two subsets, let's say uh, I and J, I would say that I, if I and J belong to this set X, I would say that I is less than or equal than J if, say, I is contained in J. So if two subsets, one is less than or equal than the other, if it is, it is contained. So you see, there are sets which neither one is contained in the other or the one is contained in the first one. Right? So these sets, for example, 1, 2, would not relate to the set 3, 4. They are just not comparable. The set 1, 2, however, would be less than or equal than the set 1, 2, 3, because this is contained in this one. Okay, so you see, you have a lot of points. And you, you, you form the graph of pairs, you know, some of the pairs may be connected by an edge, if you want to take a look at this one, the graph theory point of view. So there's just, if you just mark all the points of X as, a, as, a, as the vertices, you'll be connecting some points when they're comparable by a directed graph, let's see. Uh, all right. So this is what the partial order is. Now, let's see what is an inductive. If you want to understand what this word inductive means, uh, we first have to, to say what's an upper bound. So, so an element, so let uh, 
So let, let's say y, be a subset of x, be a, that's why be a subset of x, okay? We say that an element, say c, belonging to x is an upper bound for this subset y if y is less than or equal than c for all little y belonging to y. Okay, so an upper bound for a set y is an element of x that is bigger or equal than everybody here. Of course, it might not be unique. Okay, it's just an upper bound. Okay, so this is how we find an upper bound. Now, uh, a set y contained in x is said to be totally ordered if any two elements in y are comparable. Any certain subset is totally ordered if really any two guys there can be compared. Or either one is less, is less than equal to B or B is less than equal to A. Uh, Alright, so uh, my whole set so my whole set X is said to be inductive If, if any totally ordered subset has an upper bound. If every totally ordered subset has an upper bound. This is what it means to be inductive. Okay, so this is one thing that we want to understand. Two things, what we want to understand how when a set is inductive. So I'm, I'm defining what is an upper bound first, and I'm defining what's a totally ordered subset, and I'm concluding that inductive is if any totally ordered subset has an upper bound. And third thing, we wanted to understand what this word maximum element is. So, well, an element, a certain m belonging to x, your partially ordered set, is a maximal element. Here the definition is, is, is pretty much clear. If uh, there's no guy who is bigger than it, so in, in a certain sense, is a maximal element if Say m less than or equal than x implies that m is equal to x. So it cannot be less than or equal than a, a non-trivial guy. Except himself. Okay, so I'm not saying that. So note that uh, the maximal element doesn't have to be an upper bound for the whole set. I'm not saying that n is bigger or equal than everybody else. I'm saying that there's no one bigger than him except himself. Okay, there's no 
non trivial guy. So if, if M is less than or equal than X, then it they have to be equal. With that, without anti synthesis, I have a counterexample for absorbent level. Without anti symmetry? Yes. Without adding in, in the condition of being anti symmetric, I have a counterexample. Simply, I take 0, 1 up to infinity, and I define infinity to, to be less than or equal to 0, like a loop. In this case, this set is inductive, has an upper bound, but no maximal n, because infinity in this case wouldn't be... Uh, so, so you want to... Let's see. Let's see, yeah. You wanted to put r including infinity, right? So this is your set x. And you want to give the usual order? Yes, and I define minus infinity to be less than minus infinity. And you want to... Everybody loses to infinity, right? No, no, just to take 0, 1, 2, all the, all the non-negative natural numbers. Yeah, okay. So okay. okay. And infinity. And okay. infinity. And I define the natural order plus that infinity is less than or equal to 0. You define the natural order, yeah. right? So A is going to be... A is going to be, uh, everybody loses to, there's the natural order in N, yes. there is the, everybody loses to infinity, Yes. right, and, and infinity, infinity loses to zero. Let's start at one, okay? Okay. So let's, infinity loses to one. Yes. So it's cyclic. Yes. So everybody loses and wins against everybody. Yes. Okay? Now, this is, it doesn't have maximum elements, first of all. But it is inductive and the partial order that according to this definition. Uh, okay, so let's see. We say that uh, C belongs to X as an upper bound. So you're saying that so this is a totally ordered set that everybody would be bigger than everybody and everybody would be smaller than everybody by the definitions, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I I agree with you. I agree with you. So, I think we need this. So every set, well, every totally orders, every subset here will be totally ordered, right? And you could get a lower bound section. Yes, yes. So, so I really want. Yeah, I think you're right. So let's order. Let's let's do this for now. So, uh, how is it? Uh, inductive because infinity is another one. Well, this is kind of a trivial situation, right? When everybody is uh, it is, it everybody is bigger or equal or less than or equal than everybody else. Two is not uh, okay. You are right, but but it satisfies the uh, yeah yeah. So I really have to put something. Uh, So you're saying that, it, according to this definition, it is inductive, right? Because you're saying that uh, if you take any any two elements in Y, well, let's see, if you take any subset, any subset will be totally ordered, and there will be an upper bound. That's okay, so this would be inductive. And the maximal element won't exist in this sense, right? So this would be a non-empty order set. This that is inductive. So let, let's, yeah, okay, so for simplicity, okay, yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right, so my bad. Let's add the third condition here. So what we want and what is what? So let's do this. So if A is less than B and uh, B less than A, you want to conclude that A equals B. Is that what you're proposing? Okay, I, I go with that. Because, yeah, if you're allowed to have different elements there, you're allowed to have different elements that, that, that are bigger or equal than each other or less than or equal than each other, then you can just say, take any finite set, like three numbers, right? And you can just say that everybody is bigger than everybody else and everybody loses to everybody else, so this would trivially hold. Uh, this, this, and this. And, um, well, this would be... Uh, yeah, okay. Let's just uh, totally order in this, in this definition. Yeah, we have to say something about the complement. So if A is less than B, B cannot be bigger than B. Yeah. Okay.
Thanks for pointing Actually, that out. Actually, we can define it with two, only two conditions, but with the strict relation. I mean that we have transitivity, uh -huh. and uh, for every two, for, for every two elements, uh, only one of the cases happens. That, uh, Either A is less than B, or B is less than A, or, or no, or nothing happens, right? Yes. Yeah, that's an equivalent way of saying this, right? Okay. Va bene, va bene. Thanks for the input. Very nice. So, and by the way, if you're free to correct me every time I make a similar mistake like this. Are we good to proceed now? Okay, so this makes more sense. So let's just go with these three properties. I need transitivity and I need the non-existence of, say, redundant elements in my set. So uh, you cannot have uh, this, this condition holding at the same time. Right. Let's see, maybe if you go to another book it will be defined differently like that, but let's go, let's go with this. So what I want is that uh, every totally ordered set has an upper bound. This is what inductive means. And a maximal element is an element that has no guy bigger than, 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 than him, except himself, right? And what Soren's lemma claim, claims is that if you have an, a partially ordered set that is inductive, so every totally ordered subset has an upper bound, then there exists a maximal element. There exists a guy who doesn't lose to anybody else. Okay. Now let's... Is that okay? Does anyone have any other questions or comments? See, I like this. I like when the class joins me. Good. Let's then try to prove our theorem. Uh, let's see what we want to do. Proof. So remember that you started, you started in the subspace G. I'm drawing here a line to mean it's a subspace. And this is my whole space E. Okay? So first my function G is a linear function from G to R. So I will define my set X. So let us define. Our set big X. So the nice things about using Zorn's lemma and this, these arguments from logic, it's to actually come up with uh, the nice sets in very creative ways. So here my set X will be the sets of let's say, the maps H. So it's the set of maps H that are defined in a certain domain of H, taking values from R, satisfying the following conditions. First, D of H so G is contained in D of H, and this is a linear, which is a linear subspace of E, right? So the G is contained in D of H, which is contained in E, and D of H is a linear subspace. Second, H is a linear function. Third, H extends G because the domain of H contains subspace G. So H is defined, where G is defined, I'm saying that H extends G. So they take the same values. So this means that H of X is equal to G of X for X belonging to this new. And for I want this H of X to lose to my the upper bound function that I had from the beginning for all x and e. Okay, so this is the definition. This is the definition of my space. My space x, my, my set x, is the set of all linear functions h defined in a certain subspace of e, which I call the domain of h, taking values in r, such that 
This, sub, this domain is something between G and E. It's a linear subspace. H is a linear function in this guy. H extends G, and H loses to my upper bound function P. Right? So in most of the applications where you, have, you want to use Zorn's lemma, it's, you should get creative when defining your set, and, uh, and then you should start proving what's needed for Zorn's lemma. Sometimes, one of the tricky parts to prove is that this set that you define is actually non-empty. So my first question for you is, why is this set non-empty? G itself is non-empty. Yeah, exactly. So G is non-empty. This set is non-empty because G itself belongs to this, to this space X. Okay, the function G, the final little big G, is an example of a function like this. By hypothesis, right? Okay. So now I have to start. Oh, by the way, I have to actually define the order. I haven't defined what the order is, so this is something for me up to the, up to me to define too. So let's define. Let us define the order relationship in the set. By I'm going to say that uh, a certain let's say let's call the elements in the set H1 in domain of H1. This is a pair. I'm going to say that this is less than H2 contained in the domain of H2. Oh, let's just put it H1 less than or equal to H2. If and only if, let's say the domain of H1 is contained in the domain of H2 and H2 extends H1. So this is the order relationship. So we have two functions, h1 and h2. I'm going to say that this is less than this one if the domain of this is the subspace containing the domain of this, and this function extends this one in the, in the domain of the first one. Okay. All right. is less than or equal than h1, then they have to be the same. Good. And if h1 loses to h2 and h2 loses to h3, then h1 loses to h3 according to this definition. It's pretty much reasonable. So this goes as check. This goes as check. Now I want to see that this x is inductive. Right? So I take a set, I take a subset, so let us take y. Uh, let's take y as uh, containing x totally ordered. Okay. So let's let's say that this y is is formed by some element, say h i, where i belongs to a certain space of indexes. Call it h i because the elements are h i's and i belongs to certain indexes i. This i here is just not a countable or countable unit doesn't really matter, right? It's just a set of uh, elements of this space i. What matters is that any two of these are comparable, okay? Because this is a totally ordered set. Many times I will write things in this sense. I'm just say labeling all the elements of my set. This is no nothing to do with an interval or anything. Just you should just read this as a set of indices. 
Good. Uh, so I have to show that every totally ordered subset has an upper bound. So what would be a reasonable definition for an upper bound? We use uh, we take all the domain, we take the union of all the domains of T, yeah. and then we define a tiny point, take any one of these, find that the point lies in this one, and define it to be the value, and it is, is well defined. Yeah. So I have to construct an element in this space that majorizes that it's an upper bound for everybody here. So the and idea is to define it because of the comparability, because any two are comparable. So, to get an upper bound, we take, let's say, the domain D as being the union of this D of HI for all the I's, for all these guys. So, I take the union of these domains, okay, and then I will define this, uh, let's call this H of D to R as, so an element in this D if x is an element in this d, that's because it belongs to some guy here. So it belongs to some guy, then I can define the hi in that guy. So h will be defined as, will define h the robot, uh, putting h of x equals to hi of x if x belongs to the domain of h. So, I'm proposing a subset of your E, and I'm proposing how to define a function on this subset by this. Now, there's, a, there's lots of little things to be checked with this definition, right? So, first of all, so this would go, 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 and then we have to check some points here. First, this D is actually a subspace. actually a subspace because remember that when you find this set X these guys have to be subspaces so why is this D the union of all these things a subspace well this is just a, a, a huge union of subspaces exactly right so if you take a point X in D if you take two points X and Y in D then X is going to belong to some D of H1 Y is going to belong to some D of H2 but remember that these guys are totally ordered. So D of H1 and D of H2, one of them is going to contain another. So X, plus, X will actually belong to D of H2 as well. And X plus Y will be there too. Okay? Same thing if you want to multiply by a scalar. So if X belongs to D, then belongs to some of this guy, one of these guys. And this guy is a subspace, so you can multiply by lambda. And then, of course, it belongs to D. So you can actually sum two guys and multiply by lambda. So this guy is actually a subspace. Okay? And why is this definition first? Why is, the, is this definition good? So the definition of H is good. Good in the sense that why is this little function H well defined? Because it, it involves choosing an X. So if I, if I want to define H in a point X, it involves choosing a guy where it belongs and placing it as HI of X. So what if I chose D of H1 and, and define as H1 of X? What if you come and, okay, but X also belongs to H, D of H2, and I will define as H2 of X. It also it doesn't matter because they set it totally ordered. So it doesn't matter if your X belongs to D of H1 and H2, two different guys, and you define as H1 of X or H2 of X, because one of these two will contain the other. It means that D of H1 will contain D of H2 and H1 will extend H2. So the definition is consistent, right? So the definition of H is good in the sense that it's consistent. And the third, check, third thing to check is that H is actually a linear. And H is linear because, well, you can always multiply by a scalar, right? So if you want to take h of lambda x, x will belong to some guy, this will be hi of lambda x, and hi is linear, so the lambda comes out, so you're okay. And you can add h of y and h of, h of x and h of y, you just put x belongs to a d of h1, y belongs to a d of h2, one of them contains the other, so both of them belong to this d of h2, and then you can add them up. So there are these three little things to check, but once you checked, 
And of, obviously then this H that you constructed, this H, this um, upper bound. Do we all agree that it's an upper bound for Y? It's bigger than any element in Y, right? Because this D contains everybody here, and this H extends all the guys here. Good. Uh, good. Are we okay? So we can apply Zorn's lemma. We checked the three things. So by the Zorn's lemma, by Zorn's lemma, uh, there exists a maximum element. How are we going to call it? Let's say F. There exists a maximum element F that goes from a certain subspace H in this set. Okay. What I want to prove is that this maximum element F is actually what you're looking for. What I want to prove is that, so this F is going to be a, this H is a linear subspace, this F is going to extend G, it's going to be less than P. So we want to prove what we need to prove. We need to show that this subspace where it is defined is actually the whole space where H is equal to E. You see, Zorn's lemma, to me, at least the way I understand it, it's like induction. But it's, it's like doing induction in a setting where you cannot count. Because induction is usually in a set where you can count the elements. It's to, to deal with the, with the natural numbers or countable things. So you have the element n and you want to prove something for n plus 1. Uh, Zorn's lemma is sometimes a way to, to use the ideas of induction in, a, in an environment where you cannot count the elements but sometimes, magically, this produces a maximal element, and, and then you're just left with the one step of the induction. So, suppose this element is not what you want it to be, then there will be one guy higher, and you want to reach a contradiction. You see, it's like doing an inductive step, but you just need to go from this guy to one guy higher, and so on. And the way we're going to do is pretty much simple. Right, we're going to assume that this guy is not the whole space, and I'm going to take one dimension, which is not cold, one guy which is out, and I'm going to construct a new function on this whole space and plus one dimension. You see, I'm just doing the inductive step. But if I had started from the very beginning to try to construct it like that, okay, you could start with your G, and you can try, okay, the, maybe the, 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 the guy who's just uh, in the first year of mathematics undergrad will take this G and say, okay, if this G is not the whole space, then there's one guy out of G. He's correct, right? He's, there's one guy out, I'm going to take here x0. I'm going to take this space generated by g and this vector x0, and I'm going to construct a new function just by defining the function at x0. Perfect. And then I can construct another slightly larger space of g. If this is not still the whole space, then I can find a vector which is not there and try to do it again. But this, this would be the regular induction. But this does not work because, you know, this space here might not have a countable basis or whatever. This is a, see. This is one way of somehow replacing the ideas of induction. Somehow you're just left with this final idea of inductive step, as you see. So Zorn's lemma guarantees to me the existence of a maximal element, F. And all I have to show is that this, this, this is subspace where it's defined is the whole space E. Right? So we do this. Suppose not. Suppose that H is actually contained and it's different than E. Right? Then there exists X0 that belongs to E and does not belong to H. That is okay. So you hear, let's say this is your space H now. 
there's going to be a vector here, a point here, x0, is 0, 0. And what you're going to do is consider, I'll consider the subspace, the subspace H, let's call it H tilde, which is just generated by H and x0, if you want to write it like this, this is the, the smallest subspace generated by H and this new vector x0, or if you want, it's just H plus R times x0. So this is the linear subspace that contains H and this new vector x0. Okay? And I want to define, I would like to define a new function H tilde, or let's just call let's just call this H, H and H blah blah blah. I just want to define this function H tilde on this space, H tilde to, to R by putting what? So by linearity, the whole the function is already defined here. If it's going to extend this little h, I just have to define it on h of x here. So I would define h tilde of a certain x plus t x zero as being h of x plus t times h h prime of this vector x zero, which is a number alpha, where alpha is to be chosen. Okay, I will define, so vectors in this space are a, a sum of a vector in H plus a vector in this new direction, so it's a guy of this form. This representation is unique, so if x plus tx0 is x prime plus t prime x0, then you have x minus x prime is equal to t minus t prime x0. This guy belongs to this dimension. But this guy does not, so the only thing to do is that this is zero and this is zero. So x is equal to x prime, t is equal to t prime. So the representation of a vector in this space is like a direct sum, if you want. It's unique. So if I want to define the h prime in this guy, it's bilinearity, it's going to be h of x plus t times h of h prime of x zero, if you want. This is going to be just h of x plus t times alpha. Let's call this guy alpha. That alpha is, is, is to be defined. What else now? Well, well now I have a session. Uh, almost done, right? So this new function that I created, it satisfies a lot of problems. This, this, this h prime from this space, h tilde from this space h tilde to r, is a linear function, obviously. It extends h, right? So it's almost in my class. So what I want to show is that this, I want to show that this new function that I'm creating here actually still loses to this upper bound function p of x. If I can show this, this is the only condition in the definition, so this would imply, if I can show this, this would imply that h tilde belongs to my big class that I started with, which is a contradiction, which would be This would be a, an element strictly larger than our h, which was supposed to be a maximal element. Remember that I, sti I still have a free choice here of the parameter alpha. And this free choice of the parameter alpha is actually to make this condition hold. Right? Because you have to prove that what? By definition, you have to prove that, say, h prime of x plus t x zero loses to p of x plus t x zero for any x belonging to this h and for any p real. Alright? So this 
this is equivalent to proving that, now the definition of this is that this is h of x plus t alpha loses to p of x plus t of u for any of these guys. Okay? Now I am going to, this is equivalent to proving this, because this is how I define this function h tilde. Now if t is bigger than zero, t is bigger than zero, or as a matter of fact, my, my alpha, uh, what do I want to write here? Uh, I can, okay, so let's just say, this is equivalent to, I'm going to divide things, to divide by the modulus of t, okay? Going to divide by modulus of t, both sides. If t is not zero. If t is zero, this is obviously true, okay? If t is zero, this is obviously true because h lost to p in this space. All right, so let me write this. So this is okay if t is zero. If not, we divide by modulus of t. And what I get is that this is okay if and only if h of x divided by modulus of t plus t over modulus of t times alpha loses to p of x over t plus t over Alright, because remember that this p, if I were dividing by an absolute uh, positive guy, I could move it inside. Now, this equation has, uh, how do I interpret this? Now, of course, if this holds for any x in the space, and any t, so this, this guy will be just any guy in the space here. Okay, so what I have to prove is that I must show that I'm going to write what I must show here, that h of, say, y plus alpha loses to p of y plus x0, and that h of y minus alpha loses to p of, say, y minus x0. For all y belonging to my space. This is what I have to prove. Let's see if you guys agree. If I prove this, uh, yeah, maybe this was this was unnecessary. But suppose I prove this condition star. Okay, if I prove this condition star for any y belonging to my space h. I can just multiply by t here, and I multiply by positive t and get h of t y plus t alpha less than p t t y plus t x zero and recall ty by x, and I'll get this thing for, for t positive. If t is negative, I can just take an expression like this and multiply by the t positive, the absolute value of t, and get the expression the same way. So I need to prove these two, if I prove these two conditions, then I arrive at this. Of course, it's if and only if, because this condition here is just the case t equals 1 and t equals minus 1 of this. Right, so if I can prove this condition for the case t equals 1 or t equal, equal to minus 1 by multiplying by the absolute value of t and by using the, the linearity that goes in here and here, I prove it for all t's. So this is what you want to prove. Well, prove what we, we have to prove there exists alpha. There exists alpha. I must show that. Well, yeah. In order to prove this, I must show that this thing. So for some alpha, I must show that there is an alpha such that this holds. saying this is equivalent to saying what? That the first expression, if I move the alpha, second expression, if I move the alpha to the right, I'm saying that h of y minus p of y minus x0 is less than or equal to alpha 
and alpha itself is less than or equal than, say, p of x plus minus, minus h of y. Okay? So I have to prove that there exists an alpha such that this holds for all y belonging to my space h. You see, and up to this point in the proof, I, had not, I have not used the fact that P was sublinear. I only had to use the dilation invariance of P, right, to reduce this case to this. But I didn't use the fact that P was itself a sublinear function. So if the theorem is to be correct, this is the point where I have to evoke the sublinearity of P to see why I can actually choose this alpha such that this holds for all y belonging to h. Now, how do we want to do this? And uh, perhaps the, the, the thing is, h of y, recall that for any y belonging to my subspace h, I already had that h of y lost to p of y, right? And this p of y, now, h is just a function defined on this subspace big H. p on its own was defined on the whole space. So I can actually write p of y as p of y plus x0. what I want. Uh, this is what I want. Well, I want 2y, just 2h of y, let's put this 2h of y, this h of 2y, which loses to p of 2y. Which now I can write p of y plus x0 plus y minus x0. And this is the crucial moment, ladies and gentlemen, where I have to invoke the sublinearity of this function p. This loses to p of y plus x0 plus p of y minus x0. And this chain of inequalities here holds for all y's in h. So this means that. If I move one guy to the left and one of these h's to the right, this means that h of y minus p of y minus x0 loses to p of y plus x0 minus h of y. So for any choice of little y in this subspace h, this is always true. This is always true. Right? Uh, So it's safe to say that this implies that the supremum of h of y minus p of y minus x0, when y belongs to h, the supremum of these quantities loses to the infimum of these quantities here. Do you guys agree? Because for any point y, this guy here is bigger than the left hand side for the same y. So if I take the supremum on the side and the infimum on the side, the supremum on the side will be less than the infimum on the side. Yes, and the conclusion is that there is some alpha between. So there exists alpha, so there exists alpha in between. Because I could, I could just not conclude from this previous line, right? Because although I proved that this guy is less than this for each y, I mean, these two guys could be moving around this pair of points. So this is a pair of points in the real line. So I'm saying, this guy is less than this. That's okay, but it could be one here, one here. And when you move the y, it could be one here, and one here. And uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that, well, 
Let's see if I'm saying something wrong. No, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm still not right. So let me, okay. See, this is how proof goes. You go and make, make, yeah. make the adjustments. I want to change a little bit because I'm doing something wrong here. This is not true. Uh, what I want to, no, this is okay, but I, this, this is wrong. I don't think I can conclude from this, uh, this thing. I don't think I can conclude from this, this thing. But what I did wrong was that I started with 2y. So let me start here differently. Let me start. But why can't we conclude from this? Uh, You want, you want me to explain to you why this is wrong, right? So I'm claiming to you that the passage from this line to this line is wrong. So you have here a function of y. So x0 is fixed. You have a certain function of y here, less than a certain other function of y. So you have, say, f of y, and you have g of y. So what I'm saying is that f of y loses to g of y for any y belonging to h. Right? And I, I, I was trying to conclude that the supremum of this f of y lost to the infimum of g of y. But let's just say that g of y was uh, f of y plus 1. I cannot rule out the case that these guys are both uh, infinity. Uh, and this is actually not true, right? So if g of y is f of y plus 1, this is, this is, this is not true. The supremum would be infinity, the infimum would be minus infinity. Uh, possibly. But this would still hold. I want to make, so to correct this, what I need to is I have to make these two guys independent, this y here and this y here. So what I want is not starting with 2y. Y plus y dash? Exactly. So I want to come here with y plus y0 plus y1. This is certainly h of y0 plus h of y1. There's no need for me to be using two times the same y, right? So this is p of y0 plus y1. This is y0 plus x0 minus plus y1 minus x0 with y0. Now let's see, I want here to keep this p of y1. I want to keep on this side. Yeah, okay. So this will go on this side will be x uh, p of y1 minus x0, y1, and on this side will be y0 and then x, y0. Now it's okay. Now, so now for any pair of points, for any, for any pair of points with y0, y1 belonging to h, I have this inequality with y1 here and y0 here. So this, now it's okay. I can take the soup on this side and the inf on this side independently, because this also a pair of points, and then the soup on this side for any y1 here will lose to the inf for any y0 here. And then there's an alpha in between. For the alpha in between, of course, this will hold. Now we are right. And this concludes the proof, right? Because if there's an alpha in between, this means that I can choose my alpha to be the right value of the guy, and I'm constructing the function h tilde that extended my maximal function h, my maximal element h there before. So this is a contradiction. So indeed, this function h that we started with must have been defined in the whole space, must have been the linear function that you're looking for. Okay. I observe that this statement is not about uniqueness. There's usually not only one extension, but this Hambanak verb, this Hambanak theorem is about a, there exists one, at least one extension. It's possibly not unique. Good. I'm glad we fixed this. Are we okay? This was a nice conversation about this topic. So we see where we use the Sorn's lemma here. And, uh, but but, but uh, please, reflect on what I said to you in the beginning about the. Sometimes you are in an environment that you cannot use induction. Although the ideas of induction are very, very present, are very natural, but sometimes you just can't use because it's such an... Uh, hostile environment, for example, you don't here, it seems very natural that if you start with a function in a certain subspace and you want to extend it to the whole space, 
you would extend, say, one dimension at a time. So if, if my subspace is not the whole space, then there is one vector out. I consider the, 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 the subspace generated by this guy and this one vector. I extend the function and I go on. But since you don't have a, uh, you don't know if you have a countable basis and so on, this process will not lead to a formal solution. So when you find yourselves in these situations, the right tool might be to use something like Zorn's lemma that allows you somehow to draw a maximum element that you want, and you want to show that maximum element does the job. If not, then you would use what you have used as induction step from the beginning. Okay, and then, good. All right, so this, is, this concludes the, the presentation of the first version of Hambanak, which sometimes is called the analytic version of Hambanak. Okay? Maybe, well, maybe not today, but maybe next class we'll see what goes on on the geometric version of Hambanak. Ah, uh, okay, maybe we have 10 more minutes. Let's discuss some core layers of this. Is there any questions here? Are we cool? Okay, again, put this in your pocket. Now this becomes a weapon for you. You can use the Hambanak whenever you want. All right. Um, let's discuss some corollaries. So what I want to do in terms of corollaries. So we can conclude this proof. Uh, uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, well, let me consider E as a norm vector space. So now the, the, the nice thing is that I have E with the norm. Nice thing in, in this class from now on is that we'll be working with this so-called dual space of E. Is the space called E star. This is the space of all functionals. say it's a functional because it's, it maps into R. So it's all the functionals that are linear and continuous. Okay, so maybe first I uh, in this setting of functional analysis, maybe it's important for us to establish from the beginning the equivalence between a continuous functional and a bounded functional. Right? So this is E star. So I want to first, maybe let's just start with this proposition too. So, uh, so a functional, a linear function, let's say. F is continuous if and only if it is bound. And by bounded, by bounded you mean that there exists a constant C bigger than zero such that 
say f of x in modules is less than or equal to c times epsilon squared of x. This is the definition of bounded. I will say that a function is bounded if there exists a constant such that f of x is less than or equal to c times the norm of x. Okay? The definition of Hmm? It's enough too because it's linear, right? So it is continuous if and only if it's continuous at zero, and it, it, this is only if it's bounded. So if you want, it's another equivalence, right? So when I say for linear functionals, if it's continuous any point x is equivalent to being continuous at zero because you can just subtract, and this is equivalent to be bounded. And uh, well, yeah. Is this obvious to everyone? Or no, that's maybe if you call the proof easily here. So so if you have something that is bounded and you want it to show that it's continuous, you essentially use the definition of bounded, say that f of x minus f of y if you want is equal to f of x minus y, which is less than the constant times the y. So if you say if y gets close to x, then if y gets close to x, this goes to zero. Obviously, this goes to zero. So this implies that f is continuous. This whole definition of bound. Okay? So check. Now, if you have something continuous, why does it imply it's bounded? Well, as I said, uh, if it's continuous, suppose it's not bounded. Suppose it is not bounded, then there exists a sequence of vectors. Let's see, there's a sequence of xn. Remember, this is a linear function, okay? So there will be a sequence of xn with the norm of xn, say, being equal to 1, and f of xn going to infinity. And you can always rescale. So the, the, the statement that there is no constant that governs this inequality means that if you divide x by the absolute value of the, the norm of x here, so this is not bounded by any constant, so there will be a sequence of, of unitary guys that either goes to infinity or minus infinity. So without loss of generality, let's just say there's a sequence that goes to infinity. But this is a contradiction, right? Because, because then uh, this points xn over f of xn, they go to zero in the norm, right? Because this has norm one and this is a sequence of real numbers going to infinity. This number goes to zero, but f of xn over f of xn. Now, this is just a positive number. It goes out. It's so just 1 over f of xn times f of xn. This is identically equal to 1. So you have a sequence of factors going to 0, and the f is going to 1. This contradicts the continuity at 0. OK. All right, so from now on, in this class, when we're talking about linear functionals, and I say the continuous linear functional, you can say boundedness. They are the same thing. Bounded or a continuous linear function. Okay, then good. Uh, all right. So let me write down. So in this space, what do I want? As a matter of fact, we two is an exercise. Uh, this space here, E star, is a Banach space. Okay. Even if E is not. Even if you start just with a norm vector space, the dual is always a Banach space. And but I have to tell you what the norm is. The norm of F in this space, in this dual space, is just going to be the supremum of 
the evaluation f of x, where x belongs to e, and x is no less than or equal to And this is essentially the supreme model. F of x. So, see, the definition of the normal functional f is the supremum that is attained in the unit ball, supremum of the evaluation f of x, when x belongs to the unit ball of the vector space E. Now, you may take the absolute value if you want. Because if your point x belongs to the unit ball, minus x also belongs to the unit ball, and then one of them is going to be positive. And even by dilation, if you want, you can uh, assume that you are not only inside the unit ball, but you're actually on the unit ball, if you want. Because if you're inside, you can multiply by a dilation factor to fall in the border, and then you will, this will increase. Okay. It's just, uh, you can actually call this a supremum if you want to I have another uh, norm of x and e is actually equal to that. This is the definition of the norm. So I'm saying that this dual space with this norm is a linear function, or oh, is a binary space. So maybe uh, Start next class by doing scholars. That's very simple. We don't take 10 minutes more today and we'll finish this. So let's see. Uh, corollary, corollary 3, since I write from proposition 2, corollary 3 is the following. Let G be contained in E, be a linear subspace. And uh, so if little g from G to R is a continuous linear function. What do I want is to, uh, yeah, so this is what do I want. So for the proof of this fact, you have here a subspace G and you have the whole space E. Okay, so this, in this setting, this is a non vector space now. And uh, suppose you have a continuous linear function defined on a subspace. It has its norm here, and then you want to. The claim is that there exists an f in the functional in the in the dual of the bigger space E star that extends G. This is no problem, and uh, but the claim is that the norm of f is actually attained in this base of space G. Uh, and the idea here is to use harmonic. with this wave function P of X being just a norm G is okay. So we call that by definition G of X loses to this a certain constant 
times the modulus of x, right? Times the absolute the norm of x. This constant here, the smallest constant that you can put here in the bound in this statement is in fact the norm of the gap from the definition. It's the supremum of the values at the unit box. So it has this duality here. So, so your g would lose to this function p for all guys in this subspace, little g, big g. And uh, this is a perfectly good upper bound function in the sense of the Humbanach theorem, right? Because it's just a constant times the norm. So I told you this is multiplied by a scalar and this is sublinear. So you can use Humbanach. So you use Humbanach, then you have an extension f from e to r, a guy that extends this g such that the f of x, well, keeps losing to this, to this function p, right? So, so to this constant. So if f of x loses to a constant times the norm of x, then the norm of f will be less than or equal than this norm of g, right? But since f extends g, the norm of f is by definition already bigger or equal than the norm of g. Since f extends g, this is why I get the norm of f. Norm of g. Okay, I think I will stop here today because we're past five minutes. But maybe next next class I continue with uh, some of these corollaries of Humbach. Uh, so this is to show that if you have a linear function defined in a subspace, you can extend it without increasing the norm. Okay, this is the first corollary. We start next class with these two corollaries and discuss the geometric version of the, the Humbach table. Okay, guys. Uh, at some point this week, maybe tomorrow or Thursday, I'll, I'll put a new problem set on the website, okay? And maybe you guys can work on next week and then we revise it next Friday. Next week. So take a break of one, two days, have a couple of beers and be ready to break.